everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Well, the great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, I got a job for me. Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Thirty years ago, during the Cold War, it was an experiment. Something went wrong. They opened up a passage. When you go through this door, you come out the other side, you're in another world, identical to ours. There was one reality, and then it duplicated. We share genetics, childhood. I want to know how you became so different. A kill order came out from my side, targeting people on your side. Your wife may be her next target. Ooh, that sounds ominous. This is Douglas Viviani with the uh, rather fanatic himself, David Cohen. David, what are you a fanatic about this week? I'm a, I'm a fanatic about a series on TV that probably is not very well known, but is quickly become my favorite uh, in the sci-fi genre and in general. It's a show called Counterpart, and it's on Stars, which is one of the reasons it might not be that well known, but we'll get into that later. And I love Stars because they did a Black Sails, which was tremendous also. True. We had those people on the show a little ways back. And uh, listen, as far as I'm concerned, J.K. Simmons, besides doing, of course, those farmers uh, uh, insurance commercials, which you, believe it or not, that's why you may recognize him more than anything else, but uh, does a great job on this show. And let's just introduce we have a a a wonderful character that's on our show today from counterpart Counterpart. yes really excited to have mito hamada here who plays cyrus on counterpart just really excited mito welcome to the show hi guys thank you for having me and and mito just just give our audience a little taste of it you also were the main villain in the season eight of fox's 24 you were also on uh, emerald city and and for nbc there a little ways back when they did a modern take on the wizard of oz you've been in hawaii 5 and and some other shows as well we'll dive into all of that but we're gonna have some fun today and and i guess the first thing that i want to ask just for people who have not been exposed to the show yet is Tell me, I guess, what's the best way to say this? Why should we tune into this show? Are you asking me or Mito? Let's I'm going to ask that Mito, Mito that okay. question. The, the first, hard one to begin with. <laughs> it's hard one to begin with. I think, uh, first of all, I think it's a fantastically written show. Uh, that, that was one of the first things that attracted me to, to the project. Um, every once in a while you get a script, and the script is just is magic and you know it from from reading from the first page really and for an audience member if you've ever seen any of jk's work and you're a fan you're in for a treat because you get to see him twice and this show if you're into sci-fi it's it's such a um i call it really an an adult show and and the reason i call it an adult show is because none of the clues are given out immediately you have to really think you have to sit with it and you have to try and piece the puzzle together as the show continues to go on. So it's an incredibly, incredibly tense show, an exciting show, uh, and with a wonderful, wonderful cast that they really assembled there. Yeah, and, and Mito, just from knowing your prior work, when I started watching the show and I saw you appear on I'm like, yes, perfect, perfect <laughs> casting. I love this guy. So, uh, Thank you, thank you. So, And, and just uh, in further to answer your question, uh, question this. So, so the overall premise from a real, from like 50,000 feet here, is picture a world that we're living in right now and approximately 30 years ago somehow was duplicated. So there was another world created and each one of us has a counterpart living in the other world. And what's happened is there is an actual physical connection in a tunnel underneath Berlin that connects both of the worlds that only the respective like UN-type uh, embassies or agencies know about. So no one else in either world knows the other one exists, except for this small group of people. And that's the, that's the beauty of it, this, that we live in, we could be imagining this going on today in our world. There could be a duplicate world going on right now that we know nothing about, and there's an agency within all the agencies that we have in various countries, and there's only one globally that knows this other world exists. 
that's kind of the premise of the show. And, and what I really love about it is, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, what if there is an alternate version of you? What kind of life would that person be having? And that's kind of also the beauty of what this show explores, because you see these two very, very, very different uh, J.K. Simmons characters. Obviously, same guy, looks the same, but they could not be more different. Sort of Even like- though they... Sorry? I was going to say, sort of like the mirror universe in Star Trek. Some of our uh, listeners are familiar with our Star Trek references. I don't know if you've seen that, but not exactly. But it, I see what you're saying. It's, it's, it's the other, and another, another aspect of us and maybe something that we, some characteristic we uh, don't uh, have as a primary characteristic in this world might become the primary characteristic in, in another world. Exactly. Exactly. Like we all have a shadow side, for example. You know, there might be on the other side, that might be the prominent, uh, the prominent and characteristic from that character. So that's a, that's the really interesting part to explore about all these characters that there's two of them and we don't really know how where how and where they differ from each other and what their agendas are. Plus they have their own families and the relationships yeah. with the families are very different and exactly. family members can be different. It's it's really interesting and as Mito said what's what's really cool about it was that or is that because the first season's over now, and I'm really looking forward to the next season? <laughs> is that it, it really unfolds very slowly, so it, it leaves a lot to your discovery, and you're going back and watching it two or three times, like I've done on many occasions, to see <laughs> what, what I missed the first time, and and uh, for, it's almost like putting together a puzzle or allowing you to come to the conclusions as it's un, uh, as it's revealed for you. Um, and that's what I love about it. That's the beauty, I think, of a show like that, to, to not have it kind of chewed for you, but you actually really have to concentrate and piece it together, and, and uh, maybe what you come up with then gets, uh, gets proven or disproven. You know, you exactly. never, but that's the beauty of it. Exactly. So, Mito, how did you, w- was it the script that, that drew you to the show? How, how did you get involved with the show overall? Oh, it was, it was very interesting, because at the time, I was just coming off um, playing the Cowardly Lion on Emerald City. And as I had just finished and, and were looking for the, the next project, I, um, I was called in for a different part within, within the show of Counterpart. And uh, I, I wasn't right for that particular part, but they really, really loved what I had done. And so they asked me if I would be interested in playing this part. Oh, what was the, Cyrus. What was the part you auditioned for originally? Oh, that's not something I could say. Oh. <laughs> that, would, that, would, that would be, that's unfair. That, that, and it, it, that, that's and unlike the yeah. show, it will never be revealed to me, right? So my theories are going to just be unresolved. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> unless, unless we privately message each other on the text message, and I can tell you then, then maybe yes, who knows? But, but no, I think, I think just in fairness, that's not something that, that, uh, that one should do. But yeah, so they offered me, uh, they offered me this part, and because, I, like I said, I read the pilot and, and, we, you know, as an actor, you get a, you come across a lot of lot of scripts, and a lot of them are, are very very good. But every once in a while, you get a script that that kind of um, that really it gets you. It gets you because it gets their imagination, and you don't know where it's going, and it kind of speaks to you on many 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 levels. And that's kind of how I felt about Counterpart. You know, I think to me it was very obvious that people were going to feel about the show the way that you feel, David. And now I've got some thought here, just off the top of my head. What was going on in Berlin in 1988? I'm going to be looking that up. Uh, I don't know if the Berlin. Well, I was there. I was there. And? I was there. And, I, and well, we're, well, 1989 is when the is when the wall came down. Right. So I I was still uh, um, I don't know you know I I grew up in Germany so I was going I was just finishing up high school and uh, when the wall came down so I grew up in a town called Bonn which used to be the capital of West Germany and so we all just started driving up from Bonn to Berlin and watched the wall come down and came back with pieces of the wall and went back to school the next day. Well, that's exciting, and that's kismet in some way, because my theory is that that had something to do with the creation of this uh, uh, this counterpart. We'll see. You never know. Yeah, that's right. Just know. throwing that out there. I don't want to... Yep. <laughs> you have to you get... never know. Right. And, and there's so many theories about it right now, that being one of yeah. them that's floating around the right. internet, that people are just trying to figure the puzzle out. And that's what's great about it, too, is it's, it, even just watching a few of the episodes, the puzzle pieces are being laid out on the table, and I'm put, putting one or two of them together, but I see I've got a lot more to go. And, and But exactly. I, you know, the, the overall picture is something that I'm really looking forward to uh, to exploring, you know? Uh, and, and to me, that's 
to me, that's that's the the best kind of storytelling. You know, when when we all get invited to participate in the in in the story in that sense and trying to figure it out and piece it together. Did you? Now you said, uh, we, and we knew you spent a lot of time in Germany. Did the fact that you're, and I assume you're fluent in German, did that help yes. you with this role at all? It did, because we were playing in Germany, and there were one or two instances where maybe I had to give directions in German, and so in that sense it did help. But it helped in the sense that I was, of course, very familiar with Berlin, because we actually went to Berlin to shoot a lot of the exterior stuff. Um, one of the beautiful things is that we shot it in L.A. as well as in Berlin. So to be able to go back home and, and to uh, spend some time in Berlin while filming was, was always great. So and I think it definitely helps. Uh, it helped me prepare for the character in a way because I knew atmospherically what Berlin had to offer. Mm, that's tremendous. And we're having a great time. That was just uh, part one of four here on Everything Old is New Again with uh, Miro Hamada. We're going to be back right after this and to explore some more of uh, Counterpart as well as maybe some 24 and Emerald City. And come on back. Everything Old is New Again. <laughs> You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. <laughs> Welcome back to Everything Old is New Again. That was the beginning of uh, the 24 theme. And we're playing that for a reason because we have a special guest with us, uh, Mito Hamada, who uh, did uh, appear in 24 as the one of the main uh, villains, if you will, uh, of season 8. Uh, Kifa Sutherland uh, was your nemesis. How was that experience? That was probably one of the best experiences I've ever had so many. I had so much fun doing that. First of all, it's amazing when you get to be part of a show that you were a fan of before. That, you know, at 24 is such a, uh iconic show, and at that stage, like it said, it was already in its eighth season. So I was already a huge fan um, before I was able to be on the show. So then to finally get on set and to participate in, in the story, I had an absolute blast. Uh, like I said, yeah, probably easily the most fun I've had on the show. And it's funny because you say so most fun, but we watch the show and there's very little quote fun going on on the scene. It's so you know on the screen it's so serious and all, and you kind of forget behind the scenes that uh, that you're acting or that we're watching actors, and and so it's it's nice to hear that behind the scenes there actually were a, a few smiles, I guess, huh? Absolutely. You know, one of the beautiful things on a show that's as established as Twenty Four was when you're in your eighth season is that everything runs really, really smoothly on a on a day to day basis, so that you can relax and just show up for the takes and and turn it on, so to speak, because you know that everything is happening the way it's supposed to. Uh, so, what I was trying to say and why I had so much fun doing that is we got to do real fun stuff and and. Uh, uh, enjoy the shootouts that we used to have and and the high stakes stuff that you get to play on a show like 24 that kind of stuff when you're a guy it's a lot of fun so uh, <laughs> i had a lot of fun shooting that did, did you know in advance uh what was happening or going to happen to your character or was it kind of close to the not best? A no not a clue so the thing about 24 is they they have contacted me way back in season six because uh, they had seen me in a mini series called Path to 911, in which I was playing a lead in, and so they had contacted my reps by the time I was still living in London, and they they said, you know, we, we'd we'd love to have him on the show. So I flew out to to meet the people at the time, but then uh, uh, some other things happened. I got another part or something, uh, and it didn't work out for season six. So then, when season eight came along, they originally auditioned for a part, which I then didn't get. And then they called me afterwards, after I'd flown back to the UK. This was funny, because I had auditioned in the US, didn't get the part, flew back to the UK, and as, as I landed in the UK, they called and offered me this part. But it was only for... But yeah, I'll, I'll do it, because it's 24. So I flew over, and the two episodes then turned into uh, to 10, and that's oh, how wow. that happened. Wow, and now that turned into counterpart David Cohen. You're foaming at the mouth. You want to get some more information about that show? So yeah, so go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, so any back. Anyway, back to counterpart. Um, go for it. <laughs> so you're talking about the the set on 24, and and you know, I guess in in counterpart, it's a similar situation when you, you you're an adversary to uh, for the most part, I think 
to J.K. Simmons' character, and you oh, and your boss, oh. you and your boss, played by uh, Ulrich Thompson, Ulrich. Who, who, who's just just very underrated actor, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Absolutely. You know, the, the, you have a contentious relationship with with Howard Prime, uh, with with J.K. Uh, Simmons' character. What was it like working with J.K. Simmons and and with Ulrich Thompson? Well. Uh, with J.K., it was really easy because our relationship was exactly the opposite of what it was on, on screen. Huh. We, we got on really, really well. Um, he's an incredible rock on tour, and he's someone who uh, tells him just the most amazing stories if you prod him in the right way. Uh, so I had a, an amazing time working with J.K. Um, I loved watching him work, obviously, and seeing him switch from character to character well, was wonderful. Um, with working with Ulrich, Ulrich, of course, I, I, I had known through his work, uh, such uh, amazing work in a movie called Festin, which was, of course, one of the, the big movies in the 90s that the Dan Danish uh, uh, movie industry brought out, and he was the main star of that film. So I, I had known of his work forever, too. So to be able to be squeezed in between the these two guys was for me was heaven that's great and 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 i and you have a good time working with them because uh, a lot of times when you're working with veteran actors like that uh they know how to switch in and out a little bit easier so you can actually have fantastic conversations in between takes and then go back and shoot the scene i, I would imagine that you said before 24 was such uh, a seasoned production by the time that you appeared on it whereas counterpart mm -hmm. you guys were all kind of going through it at the same time so i imagine having someone like like J.K. around probably helped sort of relax and 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 sort of you know smooth out what would all otherwise be sort of a you know could could be a rough ride first time through right. I think the first time through is always a rough ride. I don't know who. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care who is there. The first time, I'll be honest with you, it's always a rough ride. But that's kind of the fun of it because you're piecing it together. And if it wasn't a rough ride, it would kind of be unnatural because it would be like, well, you know, you just got lucky. So I think you always have to expect a little bit, especially if you're having a production that is in two different countries and you got to shoot a little bit in L.A. and then you got to fly all the way over to Berlin and then you got to piece it all together. So there's always going to be little hiccups here and there. But uh, J.K. Is, is a dream. He is a dream to work with for all the other cast, me cast members as well. And, and uh, uh, his experience, but I, I think it's also just, you know, his talent level. <laughs> It, it, it makes a huge difference because all of us have to rise to it. Hmm. I, there was one scene where it was later in the season where uh, J.K.'s basic uh, he, he he faces off against his counterpart. They're in the same room. Well, yeah, no, oh, it's the best scene for me. That's the season. That's the best scene in the whole season. It's my favorite scene. Let's not say best. It's I, my favorite scene in the whole show, without a doubt. Yeah, it, it's this confrontation. I don't know how they shot it. I assume J.K. was in the room with another actor as he was playing each role. But it looked yes. so real, and it was so convincing that these were two completely separate people, and yet you're seeing the same person on either side. Uh, it was just mind-blowing. Really well-written yeah. and well-done. Exactly. That, that you hit it, hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what it was. Now, it's obviously, really well done, Mito. When you're when you're in uh, Berlin, obviously you're doing that for the exteriors, right? And you want to have get the feel for the show that way. Um, but I guess in L.A., you're doing most of the interiors, or are they trying to do something different? No, that's pretty much it. And okay. in, in in L.A., we were shooting mainly like interiors and things of that nature. I, I heard. Um, uh, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. And then, and then mainly we'd go to shoot the exterior stuff in, in Berlin to give it that atmosphere that we needed uh, and make it believable that we're shooting in Berlin. Which you, Some things you can recreate in L.A., but you can't recreate all of it. And so even now for season two, they're shooting in Berlin as well as in L.A. again. They or, or do we say you are shooting in, in Berlin as well? Should, what do we, <laughs> are we allowed no, can, to go I there? Can, can we, I, I, can, I, can, can, I can confirm that, that, that I am, I'm not going to be in season two. I can say that. Oh, now. so we're not going to get to meet your... We're not going to get to meet Cyrus's counterpart. N not this moment. doesn't mean that he's not going to show up eventually. I you see. Know, uh, okay. not, we, we never know. And how are they doing it? Is each season 10 shows? Is that how we can characterize it or no? 
That that's as far as I know what the format is. Yes, the, the originally order was for twenty episodes, so uh, they're now going into that second order of ten episodes, and and then uh, we'll see what happens after that. But I would I would assume that they would stick to the ten format, if not maybe expand it to thirteen. But I, I would say it's probably ten. Okay. All right. So just to confirm, we're not going to see Cyrus in any form in season two. <laughs> now you know what? Don't tell me. Don't tell, don't, don't tell me. I'd, ra- I'd rather not know. I'd rather be surprised. And let's be surprised. Let's be surprised. And I know with shows like this, you got to be surprised because all of a sudden season three will come around, and all of a sudden something will happen. And exactly. you know, there's, there's a piece of science fiction here that uh, death is not always a death, and and uh, again, you've got a counterpart. So that's a lot of fun. Yes. What what do you have on the horizon? Uh, not so much time here. We'll we'll get to more right after this, this commercial break. But uh, other things on the horizon we can look out for. Or? Yeah, well, at, right now I've just literally come out of my writing hole. I've been I've been uh, busy writing. I uh, I see myself as a storyteller, so I'm not just acting, but I also try to produce shows and, and write shows. So that's really what I've been kind of giving all my attention uh, uh, these last couple of months. But uh, I've now completed that process, and I'm ready to go out into the world again. So come out of my cave. And uh, we'll see what the next project will be. But it's uh, something's already brewing on the horizon, but I can't quite talk about it just yet. All right. Well, we're going to have to prod and, and beg and plead and have you come back uh, <laughs> at the appropriate okay, time. Yeah, <laughs> In the meantime, we'll be prodding and begging and pleading the audience here to come back right after this and everything old is new again. We'll be right back with Mito Hamada. Now, back to America's Entertainment Pop Culture Talk Show. Everything old is new again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. You're alone in this world. Welcome to your life. Afraid without options. We protect us against threats from without and from within. And you have no business being here. Definitely not Kansas. Uh, welcome back to Everything Old is New Again. You're definitely in the world of pop culture talking uh, all things, it looks like, Wizard of Oz. We're back to the Wizard of Oz in some way or another. If the listeners of our show have uh, had the pleasure of seeing us talk about lots of different things of Wizard of Oz and even taking a trip to the Wizard of Oz. So if you're looking to hear about that, uh, you're in the right place. But further, uh, we have a special guest, Mito Hamada, who played, uh, and as it was revealed, just about at the end of the uh, the run, uh, unfortunately, of, of Emerald City, that he played the Cowardly Lion, which I thought was a great reveal uh, at the end of that, uh, that show. So if you remember, that show was on basically, I'm going to call it a year, year and a half ago, Emerald City. Um, it, was, it was real different play on the Wizard of Oz and I presume reading the script seeing what they were doing and reimagining these characters was something that may have gotten you involved in this or no oh absolutely I mean I, I that that was just magical immediately you, you fall in love well you, you have these very vivid imaginations of the story because you're so familiar with it so then all of a sudden you read a script and it's completely different to everything that you know that in of itself is already very exciting. And then to kind of have this beautiful thing of discovering who all these characters are that we knew in the other story from the beginning. So finding out who is Tin Man, finding out who is Scarecrow, finding out who is uh, the Cowardly Lion, that I thought really is what made that show uh, so different and so unique which I, and, and what attracted me to it. And also how these characters became uh, those characters. They weren't born exactly. alliance per se and, and so forth. That's so. it. Uh, exactly. Yeah, what a shame, because that, that ended, I don't know that it was given the, I don't know, I want to say the chance by the studio in that, or the NBC, in that we, uh, or I enjoyed it, and our listeners enjoyed it, into the fact that, or the point that we were talking about it a bit, and discussing how different it was and was that good or bad or, or what have you but just to discuss it a, a movie from the 1930s in uh, what would you say 80 years later and to be vibrant yeah. and alive and uh, the subject of pop culture discussion uh, and it was so well acted but it was it was almost a a, a, a 
tamer because it was on NBC Game of Thrones type of uh, atmosphere. No, it was something of that, like a bit of a fantasy involved and so forth, and and the costumes and all. It was so different, so interesting. Uh, to to it must have been so wild to be a part of seeing what's going on around you there. Well, it, it, it was because every day, every day you'd walk on set and you'd see something that you'd never seen before. Um, you know, one of the main things that was so unique about that particular show is that all ten episodes were directed by the same director. Right. Tarsem Singh directed all of it, so he had a singular vision really from the beginning all the way to the end. And when you when you have somebody like that at the helm, and you have a, a visionary director like like Tarzem, then what you get is these incredible, beautiful images that we saw. And and um, and maybe maybe it was too much for for TV at the time, you know. And then maybe that's how you know who knows what the what the reasoning behind certain things are. But it was an incredible part uh, project to be a part of. Um, especially with those costumes and the way that Tarzan shot and the locations we went to. You know, one of the, the, the fun aspects about shooting that particular show is we really didn't shoot any interiors. Most of the stuff was shot outside and using natural light. So that was a big, big, big thing that, that made that show also very different. Yeah, I, I also analogi- uh, analogize it a little bit to Gotham in that it's... Uh what we just call this national TV or the original broadcast TV trying to kind of do something that is very successful on a cable uh, it's not really using the right words now but you know old school here the the, the cable kind of television show in that they've got a little more freedom to show a little more blood or a little more uh, edgy kind of a a story you know and I I, I would respectfully suggest that if if Emerald City was on an HBO or something of that nature or stars uh, it may have survived and gone a little longer longer because it, it had a lot more story to tell don't you think i absolutely i couldn't agree with you a hundred percent i absolutely think that if it was on a different area it, it might have had more of a chance but you know at, at the end of the day that's just you know water under the bridge and you keep going but but um it it was it, i mean it's just a great story and the characters are so rich there's so much there to explore it's a fantastic world and i hope somebody else picks that world up and revisits that world again because i think there is still so much to explore i, I agree and uh, we had uh, david schulner believe it or not on the show we'll brag a little bit oh uh, of course <laughs> david <laughs> and i'm going to just play a smidge of a clip that he talked about we, our show talks about everything old is new again and this show the emerald city was perfect for that of course because it's relying upon entertainment from the past but producing new entertainment today and that, that's what we like to talk about so let's just uh, explore that just for two seconds here well, I yes, know what's great about your show and what's great about the topic that you guys tackle is, I don't know, it, it was always thus. If you look at Shakespeare's plays, Shakespeare's plays were always based on someone else's plays or based on someone else. I mean, everything old is new again is not new, and, you know, in the, in the best meaning of that. Every, there, there are no new stories. All we can do is adapt our own mythology and our own stories for the day. And that's what the Greeks did, and that's what Shakespeare did, and that's what TV and pop culture is doing now. It's taking our modern myth and making them relevant. I accept the compliment of being in the same sentence as Shakespeare. I- I'm kidding when I say that. <laughs> but, okay, there you go. Little by, by the way, David never agreed to come back again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, we haven't asked him yet. When he has another project, I'm sure he'll be back. But, oh, he's, he's, he's doing, yes, he's got a great project going on right now. Ah, okay, so we're going to have to keep uh, an eye uh, or our ear to the ground and, and hear what's happening there once uh, that information is released. We had a great time with yes. him. And uh, so now he was uh, someone that you were working with as well. So this was a, a, a quite a talented uh, uh, ensemble, if you will, of uh, production writers, directors, as well as actors. So, um, yeah. Absolutely. He was he was the show he was one of our showrunners on Emerald City and and I think uh, you know what he was touching on there is something that I I, I absolutely one hundred percent agree with there's there is only so many stories and one of the beautiful things about being in the storytelling business is <coughs> excuse me is that you get to see shows from all over the world and each country and has its own language with which it tells a story and its own unique way of telling that particular story and that's something that i've always loved exploring and watching and seeing how various cultures and countries tell the same themes because the themes are always the same but how do they tell their stories and that's the beautiful thing about human nature we all tell our stories so differently even though the themes are all the same 
Right, sort of a, a Joseph Campbell kind of a, a reference here, if you're familiar or not. Uh, the idea is that he studied uh, myths throughout all, as you just said, all, all the different cultures uh, of the world and different time frames and saw lots of the same elements in different cultures of coming-of-age stories or myths and stories that were trying to teach uh, uh, and, and morality plays within different cultures. But meanwhile, they had this, di- as you say, different ways of telling the story, uh, but mm-hmm. it essence the same same essence the same human nature coming out of and trying to teach through these stories and i assume that's something that, that that's something with respect to your writing uh that maybe you're trying to bring to the table or not absolutely always and i and i think that's a, that's the thing that how we connect to each other is is through the telling of stories and how we teach each other is through the telling of stories or it's one of the ways that we connect and teach each other is through through the telling of stories and i always give this example is like uh, uh, when you have you, i don't know if you've ever seen a bollywood movie you know if you watch a bollywood movie it's, it, it can be a, a highly dramatical scene and in the middle of this dramatical scene they can dance and sing all of a sudden there's a song and dance number And for us Westerners, that seems very odd. But for them, it's completely part and parcel of their culture and how they express themselves and how they express their emotions in that way. That's what I love exploring, and that's what I love seeing, is how we as humans from various parts in the world express ourselves in various situations. There we go. As Mr. Spock would say and the Vulcans say in Star Trek, infinite diversity and infinite combinations, right? Uh, Exactly. I love that. Yes, (laughs) yes. Uh, So we're having a great time with Mito Hamada. When we get back, we're going to have David Cohen uh, explore a little more and pry a little more of the behind the scenes and and actually maybe what's on the screen of Counterpart and uh, have some fun with our last section here on Everything Old is New Again. Mito, hold on. Right, We'll be right back right after this on Everything Old is New Again. This is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Uh, the best theme so theme song of all time. That was uh, the new version of Hawaii Five O, which we were. By the way, is uh, it. it's on the eighth season now. Uh, so that's it's been I know. certainly successful. Crazy. Yeah, we're here with uh, Mito Hamada, David Cohen, Douglas Viviani, and everything old is new again. Uh, I know you appeared uh, one time there uh, on Hawaii Five O, and I just have to, of course, ask you a question about Hawaii or two about Hawaii and that experience. Certainly, they fly you out there. You, you film there. Hawaii is a small area is it is it all taking place in Oahu or is there other islands that you visited while you were there filming well I I only shot on Oahu I don't know if they're on every on, on different episodes they might go to different locations depending on what they need for that particular episode but as far as I know the the main studio and where we shot was all on on Oahu and were you near Honolulu I presume you are at some point Yes, I was. I was in Honolulu. Yes, we were in Honolulu, and, um, and no, actually, I was in. They put us in Waikiki. So yeah, it, it was. Um, it, it's one of those jobs where you kind of can't call anybody and say that you're working, right? Because. Um, you're not really working. <laughs> exactly. Now, uh, crazy question. My favorite place, Moose McGillicuddy. Did you get a chance to visit there? I didn't. No, okay. I didn't. I, I went. I went to the. Um, I went to a big crater, and then I went um, a diving with dolphins and turtles. I did that. Not so bad. It's all right. Not so bad. I know. I not so bad. And then you know, did a little bit of shooting in between. Right. It was fine. It was exactly. a good holiday. <laughs> you imagine having the having the tough life of being a, a regular on that show for eight years. Oh my god! <laughs> I tell you, I, I was. I came back from that job, and I told, called my agent, and I said, "So, what shows are shooting in Hawaii over the next five years? Because I'd, I'd like to. I'd like to move there." Yeah, little I hint: did, Mag- Magnum PI is coming back. Little hint. So uh, maybe you can. I heard. I heard. <laughs> Yes, I heard. I, I already put a call in. I hey, put a call yeah. in to see what happened. <laughs> um, uh, on the other side of the fence, David Cohen, take it away for counterpart. Let's let's hear a little more about the Star Show counterpart. Which yeah, so really I, I have about three hours of questions left. <laughs> so uh, let's okay. get it. Off. <laughs> Mita oh, will be here for ten minutes, but you can keep going. I'll answer some of them. <laughs> so, Mito, what it, it seemed to me, I guess this is a question from a, a viewer side of the world. 
How secret did they keep the scripts from the actors? In other words, did you know the whole character arc of Cyrus from day one, or what, what was that process like? No, I, I didn't. So in, in this particular, we would get the episodes, I think, in twos for the most part. Okay. We get them in twos, and then and then there was always constant rewrite. So you you kind of had uh, uh, an idea, but you didn't have the full picture. You had a kind of idea of two episodes ahead, maybe. And what was what was your take on Cyrus? Like, what, can you, can you describe what your view of his role on the show mm. was? Well, he was Aldrich's right hand man, and Aldrich is part of um, housekeeping, so to speak. So within the company that kind of oversees this uh, relationship between these two worlds, they're kind of like uh, I would say the internal police force, so to speak. And and Aldrich is so to speak, at the head of said police force, and I'm basically uh, I played his right hand man, pretty much executing the orders and executing whatever he wants to do. Within that, I think uh, we're very different as personalities and who we are and how we approach the problems. I think Cyrus is much more of a hothead uh, uh, when it comes to certain situations, and while Aldrich plays everything pretty cool, calm, and collected. Um, Cyrus is more of an emotional person. He's more connected to um, to his guys, and I think that's why when you see, if you've seen the show, and you see the, the mayhem that ensues in the last two episodes in No Man's Land, where, where many of the people within the agency get shot, that's what finally triggers Cyrus and... and uh, and lets him go off the deep end a little bit. Yeah, he, he kind of goes rogue at the end there, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think it's a, it's a thing that happens with, with, uh, with PTSD. I think when you, when you see your own people get shot and killed like that, then at some stage the, the rational mind gets set aside and, and uh, uh, emotion just kind of take over, and he's in that state, especially as he was slightly inebriated as well. Slightly inebriated, which I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, why else would Claire have been able to kick Cyrus's butt at the end? I ha that, I'm still reconciling that in my mind. Okay, that will get explained, I'm sure, in terms of who she is. So you'll just have to wait and see. But uh, yes, she's a badass, because Cyrus is a badass and she kicked his ass. So yes, absolutely. <laughs> And, okay, so did you ever kind of go through the scenario in your mind as an actor? Like, okay, how did I lose this fight? <laughs> do, you know, do you know, I actually had a conversation with the showrunner at the time, and we discussed, we discussed this, and, then, and I, I brought this up, and uh, various things were discussed at the time. Um, but we didn't actually solve it at that particular day. <laughs> Interesting. We, we, decided, we decided that that's, uh, season two will make that clear. Okay, good. Good to know. Interesting, because because Mito is is six one and then uh, a burly uh, gentleman, and and uh, you know <laughs> right. to see that happen, I don't want to go. I want to get too much away, but so obviously there's yeah. something there's something going on there even more than than can be uh, revealed. So that's what we love the show is uh, yet another piece of the puzzle that that will reveal itself when the next season arises arrives. That you, is correct. Have any clue? I know you're not you know necessarily involved in it, but do you have any clue when the next season is to be uh, aired? Any ideas? Um, I, I don't actually know. I know that they're shooting it as we speak now, so I'm assuming that they'll probably be finished shooting it uh, uh, towards the middle of the summer. So I would probably assume that they will air it similar to the same time that the first season was aired, so around the beginning of the year. Yeah, that, I, I had heard something about that. Yeah, early, early 2019. Uh, that, yeah, that would be my guess. So what, and again, I apologize for all of the counterpart questions I've asked you. But as, you as you can tell, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a fan. You're boy a fan. Than, uh, yes. yes. I love it. I love it. <laughs> what, what do you take away as, as Milo, Mito from, from your, from the experience? What, what was your favorite moment? Um, and, and in general, what do you take away from it as an actor? Oh, wow. A, a lot of things on, on many different levels. I think the first thing is, is the, the human side. You're always working with people, and so you're always forming relationships. So you take away the relationships that you formed with various cast members or various people within the crew, and because you get to know people when you spend eight, nine months together. Hmm. And so, so you take away those relationships. 
uh, for certain. The experience as well is, you know, when you are a company and you're working in a, in a, in a country that is not your own. So all of us traveling to Germany and having to shoot there and, and how you bond and have lunches and meals together and get to know each other. You take away all of those experiences. Then you get to the actual, the acting part. You take away all the experience from that, the, the fun you had shooting that particular scene or working with JK in there or the laugh we had in, in, at, while we're shooting that particular scene. JK made a joke and that was really funny. So you, there's so many impressions that you take away uh, the, truth be told it's a it's a blessed profession um, because it's a profession that makes a lot of memories that's great um, and and I guess you know the the other question I wanted to ask you was um, you know and you I think you touched on it a little bit when you were, you were just saying about JK uh, joking sometimes you know it's such a serious tone and the scenes for the most part are so you know serious and almost you know it's life and death that every Hello? scene that takes takes place so uh, how did how did you guys counterbalance that I mean you, you you just filmed a really serious real serious scene and the director says cut and and how do you get back to normal life yeah that's a really good question I think you know, for the duration of the shooting of that particular scene, I think you kind of stay in that bubble. You know, you don't, you try not to get out of that bubble, and you stay in that bubble of trying to stay focused and 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 to maintain the concentration that it takes. But I think once the um, once you get to your trailer and, and the kind of the day is over, I think every every person has their own kind of routine how they get out of it. For for me, kind of it, it's a symbolic taking off of the clothes. You know, once you start getting out of the costume and you start putting your own clothes on, that kind of signifies something for me as in that journey is now over and I'm starting the new journey, which is Mido is now going on with the rest of his day. And so that that is kind of something that I do uh, and it kind of works for me. Um, having said that, you know, when you when you play very emotional stuff, you, you still end up being very tired at the end of the day because you've used up a lot of emotions. So... But um, but for the most part, it's it's you just you, you know for me it's like I'm putting on my clothes. That part is now over. Great! It's time for us to put our clothes uh, <laughs> trying to do <laughs> oh, in the closet here for this particular uh, interview, this particular show of everything old is new again. And we thank you so much for your time, uh, Mito Hamada. Uh, it's it's been a, an absolute pleasure. You've, you've been a, a tremendous guest, and and you open the door to so many different things for us to explore uh, in these different series. As we're looking forward to, if you haven't seen already, Counterpart, go to uh, Stars, and you could you could binge that for sure, and and then you'll be hooked and and have to wait until the new year for the next uh, installment and i would say the year after because i'm uh something tells me that uh mito's uh, counterpart may be back we'll see uh, but in, in the in the interim we'll be looking for you on the screen elsewhere you're welcome back anytime to anything old is new again and, and we thank you for your time so much thank you for having me absolute pleasure thank you all right terrific have a great day thank you you too take care all right, come on back everything old is new again next week it's all things pop culture